What's up guys, Dave here with The Blind Spot. Uh, thanks for uh, vi listening to us. Uh, today we have um, one of my, probably like my mentors, big <laughs> brother, uh, put it all on my coach, uh, Jesse Berta. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me guys, appreciate uh, it. A little bit about Jesse from my perspective, uh, about probably about four years ago, mm -hmm. I came to uh, PowerWad at the CSA gym in Dublin looking to just get stronger. Mm -hmm. I was kind of a, a weak little old man. Uh -huh. uh, and. Uh, got the chance to start training with you after listening to you on a podcast with your best friend, Mark Bell. Right, yes. And come full circle, we're here sitting, talking about um, health, wellness, kind of in our limo industry, specifically. Sure. Yeah. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about yourself? Uh, so, Jesse Burdick again. Um, I've been a strength and conditioning coach for about 20 years. My background is uh, in sports. I was a Division One baseball player, played a little semi-professional. Uh, and at the time met a girl, drove out to California with her, uh, retired from baseball and started to kind of get into what I thought I wanted to do, which was kind of the strength and conditioning side of things. Started at a facility in um, San Francisco and I was very, very lucky. The manager who hired me was a, um, was a chiropractor. I got to work with some PTs, some OTs and um, a bunch of other really high level, high education um, coaches and trainers at the time. And, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I got from there was just the, you know, big push and encouragement to kind of learn and get out there and kind of figure some stuff out. So, you know, I went in and I read everything, took every course that I could, had more uh, initials after my name than I actually did in my name, nice. both middle uh, and last name, first middle and last name. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, like a lot of people understand, it doesn't necessarily matter all that stuff. It matters, you know, if you can take that knowledge and start to apply it to people. So. It gave me a really interesting, cool laboratory to kind of reach out and, you know, I had people who were, you know, 70 plus years old, had professional athletes. So it spanned the gamut of, you know, dealing with people and was able to kind of figure out how to help manage lifestyle, develop good habits and kind of help people get a little bit healthier. And, you know, I had people who were CEOs of, you know, enormous uh, insurance conglomerates to, you know, again, professional athletes to tech nerds to, you know, everybody else, you know, and in between. So figuring out like kind of the common denominator with all of them. And, you know, and from there, I, uh, you know, figured I wanted to keep being competitive and, you know, found powerlifting, found a gym out in uh, Concord, started powerlifting, started a powerlifting career there. Um, and, you know, over the course of maybe the next like five to eight years, I, um, became an elite level lifter at three different weight classes. And when I left that gym and kind of started my own stuff in the East Bay, I added two more on there. Uh, so I'm one of like 20 or 30 people in powerlifting history of five different elite level um, totals in five different weight classes. Um, and then just kind of kept pushing the training side of things because the, the more, um, kind of the more well-known I got, the more people I wanted to kind of come in. So. Right. As I got to a point where my career was like, it was like, oh, okay, cool, you know, I had kids and I was trying to move on, you know, kind of coaching side kind of picked up and I was able to kind of revert all the way back to what I was doing in San Francisco and really kind of dive more into educating myself and trying to figure out how to, you know, uh, instill good habits and, um, and things with people and really trying to just help people and uh, help people accomplish their goals. You know, it's a, I think Joey DeFranco uh, said this in one of his uh, things, but you know, I get to show up to the gym in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and help people change their lives. And I mean, it's uh, it's anything and all that I could ever ask for. You know, I had this, I don't know if it was a Jewish or a Catholic guilt thing that was kind of hanging <laughs> on me. Half and half. Yeah, half and half. But uh, you know, my parents were, I had amazing parents and therefore and a lot of really, really great coaches. Awesome. And I felt somewhat indebted to them uh, to, because a lot of people don't have that. To, to try and be that for other people right. and um, you know that's what you know kind of try to make my mission and try and reach other people and you know it during the whole process I've actually you know helped out a lot of you know kind of business people as well yep. and then you know not only that but also I've birthed a whole bunch of coaches myself so I mean these are the people that I got to touch that therefore kind of get to touch other people don't touch everybody now though yeah. without gloves or anything coronavirus but anyways um, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, I'm really, really proud of that. I and mean, it's just about kind of continuing that and moving on and, you know, trying to spread the good word and 
and, and just help people kind of see that they're so much more powerful and strong than they are and uh, you know kind of let that bleed into every other uh, aspect of their life. Yeah, and I think that's a really cool point because I think for me specifically when I came to you, I was kind of like this, oh, okay, I have a little bit of strength. I'm really strong in my business side. I'm really strong. I was a cop at the time. Right. Um, and I was like, but I'm not strong physically. And you taught me how to kind of blend everything together by getting strong physically first. Yeah, I mean. And because mentally then it becomes natural. Yeah, there's, a, you know, um, Henry Rollins says something about, you know, he, he was a big weightlifter. Uh, and he talks about, you know, what 200 pounds means to some people. And some people it's 200 pounds. And to other people, it's 200 pounds. Right. Well, that's a really big mark for a lot of people, whether it's 100, 200, 300, 4, 5, whatever they end right. up, you know, whatever number you want to end up putting on it. But if we can get you to kind of, you know, it, it's going to teach you hard work and consistency, right. building good habits, right. and then to overcome something, you know, make a goal, create it, overcome that goal, and then you kind of keep moving further and further past it. The cool thing about, you know, weightlifting is there's always more weight to put on the bar. Oh, they haven't created a bar that can't hold more weight. Well, yet. We just saw the Thor. Yeah, no, exactly. Thought Thor just did that. So I mean, it's going to always continue. That uh, there's always more to do. Right. And understanding that, I'm like, okay, cool. I hit this, but there's more and more and more and more in front and more stuff that you can do. Um, just helping people kind of understand that, and then you kind of look back at it, and then to see people's uh, mindsets change when they go home to their wives or you know other colleagues, and they talk about what they did, and they're like. You lifted 400 pounds? Like, well, first of all, it's usually why. <laughs> That's the first question. And second of all, it's just like, aren't you afraid that you're going to get hurt and all this other stuff? <clears throat> and it's a, you know, it becomes a, a badge of honor that, you know, that you can do this, and then you realize that you're you're a part of a very small percent of people who understand what it's like to work hard, be in somewhat of pain, set goals, overcome some stuff, yep. and then you're like, oh. This applies to everything. This applies to my relationships, to my business, and anything else that I end up wanting to do. So, you know, I've been very, very lucky to, you know, watch a lot of people's careers, whether they're in coaching or, you know, limo service or, you know, tech or insurance or whatever it is, really start to apply what we've been doing in the gym to what they do there and really have things kind of take off. And, you know, it's whether it's a metaphor for life or if it just teaches hard work or the ability to overcome, you know, it's been... Um, it's been a really special journey and it's been really, really cool. And, you know, obviously the journey never stops. Um, there's oh, always one more pound. There's always one more person that, you know, get up there and then, right. you know, kind of go from there. So it's been, you know, it's been pretty cool. And, you know, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun, you know, and it's, it's, you know, I've got to do a lot of really, really cool stuff, go see a lot of cool stuff, yeah. meet a lot of cool people, know a lot of cool people. And, um, but the most rewarding thing is, is like, you know, people like Dustin and, you know, all these other people who you can, significantly change their life through, you know, big amounts of weight loss and then they can really kind of change their habits in their life and then so many things open up and they're able to do so much more stuff. So and we'll, we'll talk about mm -hmm. Dustin a little bit yeah, later because sure, sure. I think that's a really good, good tell us to what the next topic, but let's go back a little bit about powerlifting because a lot mm -hmm. of people say, oh, I, I don't want to powerlift because I don't want to get bulky. Right. right? And I mean, obviously we're sitting here, I'm 240 pounds. Pretty bulky, yeah. you know. How, what do you think? Everyone put on the Corona nineteen. Yeah, I, I got the, I got the, I got the Corona twenty five. <laughs> Corona twenty five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm trying to get it. We're, we're working out. Me and so Rodrigo, who I said was like fleet manager, uh, we started working out a couple weeks ago, and we, we just basically been kind of doing the basic. And he, the first time he did deadlift with me, he was like, "I'm gonna hurt. I don't want to get hurt." I'm like, right. "Just do it right and do it yeah. slow. You're not gonna get hurt." But let's go back again. So um, powerlifting it consists of three things: deadlift, squat, and bench. Yes. Um, talk from about that you get a total which is pretty much what uh, everyone's kind of looking you know for or at right and there's if you're gonna be competitive there are certain weight classes and then you can kind of they have powerlifting meets which I don't know what that's gonna look like in the future but um, you well, know at this be, it will be <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can go and compete and kind of set you know set goals set weights and you know set records and kind of go from there give us some of your records uh, my best squat is uh, 909 pounds. My best bench is 633. My best deadlift is uh, eight, uh, 824, I think. So just relative, guys, uh, I'm gonna just kind of give you guys- yeah, Those are all done around 275. 275, yeah. okay. So I, um, my first year in with you, you, well, I was like, hey, I think I wanna compete just to kind of see what my body can do. Sure. Um, and I remember training up to it and 
you know, I was, well, I, I went to 220, I think I was in the 220 class, or 242. Uh, I, I think, think I was wanted to do 220s, but I Yeah, I, I think I was sitting at 225, yeah. So for those that don't understand, um, powerlifting and a lot of competitions and weightlifting and stuff is based on weight of your body. And I don't care, I'm not competing for like an award or money, I was competing just to see how strong I was. Mm -hmm. This was my first competition, so I was sitting around 225, I think 230-ish. And so if you just heard his numbers, my numbers were basically half of his. <laughs> and he only weighed 40 pounds like bigger than me, or 45 pounds bigger than me. So, but it is a lot about training and being consistent about how you eat. Your, your training is the most important thing, I think, next to eating. Yeah. Right? And um, to take those numbers and put it relative to me, you know, for me, that was strong. I went in there never being able to really bench over 185, and then I think I benched 305 or 30, yeah, 315, something in that area. Over 300. Yeah, I pulled close to a little over 500. Yeah. I squatted right above 400. And so it was these numbers that I never thought I could attain, but it really becomes second nature when you start to think about your training. Mm -hmm. Uh, muscle memory is super important. I remember in law enforcement they talk about, you know, pulling your gun out and you know you do rotation and muscle memory. And even if it's unloaded, you just keep doing it and doing it so you know how to get it out of the holster in a fast way. Yeah. But it's kind of the same thing you talk about. It's just reps. reps. Yeah. <laughs> and we did a shit ton of reps. Yeah. Um, but what I think the greatest tool you gave me was to apply it to everything outside of my life. Mm. You know, going through PTSD, building a, a great company with a lot of people around me, family, everything. You always taught me to like, don't let it just be about powerlifting. Take what you're learning here. And I mean, we've had amazing talks about business. Yeah. You have a, like, if you guys don't know, Jesse, <laughs> what does Mark Bell call you? Megamind. Megamind. Okay, this guy's that's, brain. That's more like because of the size. Of my head. I'm not going to go that <laughs> way. Okay? He might have a big head, but that's not for me to judge. Um, but it really, you do have a certain way of thinking. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, Jim Rat, you know, you know, these guys don't have brains. Like, I'm baffled by every time we have a conversation about business, you're like, seriously, five steps ahead. Yeah. And I, I mean, where do, you, where do you count that for? Uh, I think it's just uh, natural curiosity and uh, something I took from my dad. Um, I remember very distinctly uh, moving from our childhood house to, uh, uh, to the house that they're, uh, they actually still live in. Um, we counted, I think my dad ho had over 20,000 books. So he worked at, uh, in, a, in a paper factory okay. and he was in shipping and receiving. So he's basically loading and unloading trucks okay. all night. Uh, but the secret was, was there's no deliveries after midnight. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there are deliveries that come in at about like 6 a.m. Okay. So there's a really big span that he could just be, he had to be awake. Right. But, you know, so he would just read and he was a really avid reader and stuff. And I kind of took away like, hey, if, you have, if you're ever curious about something, if you ever want to learn something or learn how something works or how to do something, there's books on everything. Right. Just go ahead and start reading it. And, you know, uh, there was that. And then, you know, I had a, a, my degrees were psychology and sociology in, in, uh, in college. And I'm just interested in people. I just love stories. So whenever anyone kind of comes and talks to me, you know, I just want to know who they are. And, and the reason why I want to know who you are and what kind of makes you take is so I can know how to motivate you and push you a little bit further. Right. But in also, in all of that stuff, it's about, you know, hey, what do you do? What's going on? You know, I'm trying to kind of get some stuff out of you so I can understand some stuff. But I'm just interested in, you know, I know what I do. Right. I, you know, like, I don't know what you do. I don't know what a lot of other people do, but I'm interested in it because... There's always going to be a cross mingling in you know what people are doing, whether you know from motivation to execution to you know even kind of the software that people use, email, whatever you know whatever it ends up being. Um, you know it's always incredibly interesting. You know I remember there was a guy that I that I that I trained in San Francisco. Uh, he, he had the strangest goal of all time. He came to me and we started working and he lost like 40 pounds. He's feeling good. He's just like you know setting these kind of goals. He's like, all right, what's your next goal? He's like, Jesse on by a gay guy. I was like, oh, you're, are you gay? That's cool. And he's just like, no. He goes, but gay guys have really high standards. And if they hit on a straight dude, you made it. Winning. You, you Winning. Win. Not only are you looking good, but you're dressed well, you're groomed well, you smell good, you're at the right club, the you're whole doing some shit. And I remember, like, you know, we worked hard, we did this thing, whatever. And, you know, he called me at, like, 3.30 in the morning. He's like, we did it. <laughs> we did it. I was like, Zach, we did. Like, what did we do? He goes, just got hit by a gay dude. It's like, oh, 
congratulations, yeah. man. That's cool. Can like, I go back to sleep? Are we gonna be working out at six thirty? He's like, no, man. But I just, we did it. We did it. Like, <laughs> all right, but cool. So I hung up the phone, and you know, a couple days later, I saw him. He was like, yep, super, super gay guy. It was all about me at the bar. It's like, okay, cool. But he was the one, you know, who like. Talk, you know, I didn't have a cell phone at the time. Okay. He was like, you gotta get a cell phone. He goes, these things are gonna explode, you know. I was just like, oh, they're so, you know, that was like the tiny, super tiny flip phones where, right. you know, got like the Zoolander, like super small. Right. <clears throat> he was like, just wait. He goes, they're gonna like put all this stuff together. It's gonna be a computer in your pocket. And he was like explaining all this stuff to me and it was fascinating. I didn't believe any of it, but it all came true. Sure. Look at this um, yeah, I know. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where I always want to learn. There's always something to learn about it. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, you know, how you did it, why you did it, what was motivation was, there's always something to kind of gain from that. And, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's kind of a rigor mortis thing where if you stop, you die. Right. If you stop learning, you die. Your brain's a muscle. you got to exercise it. So, you know, always just, you know, big on, you know, your own kind of education, not forced education. Yeah, and I think, like, for me, you know, forced education never was good. Uh, I, I was never good at anybody. I was never good at school, <laughs> but uh, let's turn a corner a little bit. Sure. So, um, obviously, you're here visiting Urban BCN, which yep. is our headquarters here in South San Francisco. This is your first time. This is the first time. I've four seen pictures, years. and I know almost everyone here. Yeah. But uh, it's pretty awesome. It's yep. really impressive, actually. Pretty cool. I mean, obviously, <clears throat> right now we're going through COVID 19, a uh, pandemic that's changed the world completely, upside yeah. down. Yep. What we thought was normal is no longer normal. Um, you know, a lot of people in the beginning were freaking out, which totally understand. It's starting to slow down. We're starting to see the reopening. Um, I took a lot of this time to kind of reevaluate myself and how I'm thinking and my processes. And we've talked over through text message a lot about that kind of stuff. Um, so obviously, you know, a lot of my drivers mm -hmm. um, and you've got to know them over the years because you use our services here and everywhere, yeah. everywhere else. Um, but let, I, I want to kind of turn into, you know, uh, health and wellness for drivers and owners sure. specifically, you know, uh, a driver works anywhere between eight and 12 hours a day, five to seven days a week, depending on where they work or who they work for. Um, and they're in the car. And one of the things that I hear a lot about, a lot from the drivers, oh, my butt hurts. My sciatica is kicking in. Uh, I'm feeling heavy. You know, we did a weight challenge last year, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was last year and all the guys did so good. And one of the winners won 1500 bucks. Right. And it, it was, the pot was everybody put in money and that was a way for them to kind of have an incentive. Sure. And it's accountability. Accountability, yeah. right? Um, so what do you, what are some of the tips that you would give to a driver who's sitting in a car or an owner who sits in his chair for eight hours and doesn't move because he's so busy? Well, yeah. some tips. Well, I think first of all, you know, the, the, my mom always had a quote. It's like, you're a special little snowflake, but you're not that fucking special. And, um, and amazing. And moment. you say that to me a lot. And I say that to you a lot, a lot. And I say that to a lot of people a lot because, I mean, when we really look at it, you know, so you're sitting down eight to 12 hours a day. You're the same person who's a tech nerd who's sitting down, you know, doing the same thing every day. Same thing as the owner, everybody else. So the problems that you have aren't, you know, just yours. Which means that there are a lot of other people who have overcome these problems. Right. Right? And it's going to be, you know, small stuff to start and those small things lead up to big things. So the biggest thing is, is you know, I've actually talked to a couple of drivers uh, uh, about it. <clears throat> Some of the small stuff is just, you know, you, you, if you're a good driver, you're required to be there a little bit early. You know, you can park a little further away, um, you can get out and stretch, you can kind of start to try and move around. You know, what we see with people who are sitting a whole, whole lot is, you know, your, your glutes, you know, underactivate and almost turn off, your lower back kind of slumps over. And this could be from the seat or you're too far away, too close, don't necessarily fit in the car, it's not comfortable, whatever it ends up kind of being. But you know, you just got to get your, um, you got to stretch in order to kind of alleviate a lot of like the lower back pain and kind of sciatica stuff that it, that a lot of people end up dealing with. Right. It, it's, it's a lot of poor posture in a seated position too much. Now it's part of your part of your job. Right. So you can't get rid of it. Correct. But there are stuff that you can do to kind of start to overturn these things. And one of the most important things to think about is, you know, this didn't happen to you your first trip. Correct. This happened maybe on the thousandth trip or right. something along those lines. Right. So can't expect the one stretch or the one thing to alleviate it in about a day or two. It's going to be a process that you have to kind of oh, you have to climb up this mountain mm -hmm. in order to start to kind of make these changes. So things like just moving around, just period moving right. is going to be good. Park right. your car, walk around your car a couple of times, do a couple of stretches, stretch your quads, your hip flexors, which are kind of you know up here, which are going to force you to this way. If you don't, 
and then get you to kind of stand up. So stretch your quads, stretch your hip flexors kind of in front of you. Make sure you're flexing your abs, flexing your, um, flexing your glutes. Um, try and find a way to get 10 minute walks in, right? Just get out there and you know, you can be 10 minutes early. If you're 15 minutes early, you're 10 minutes late. Right. Uh, so, <clears throat> I just popped in on mic, sorry. Yeah, um, COVID. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hand sanitizer. I think Where's the engineer? We need it. <laughs> I think is that that's going to be the new Kobe, right? Yeah, it's, it's gonna, like COVID. COVID. Anytime, Everyone's yeah. going to say that. Right. Um, but there's so many things, and they don't have you know you don't necessarily have to get to a gym or do anything or wake up early or stay up late or really try and reroute your schedule. But if you can just kind of move, just movement. Period. You start to throw some stretches in every once in a while. Kind of flex your abs every once in a while. Try and you know squeeze your glutes. If you can do that and be consistent with it. A lot of that stuff will start to kind of disappear, and then you know, once you know, once those things start to get better and better and better, there's a whole lot of other stuff you can do. You know, training, start to work on your diet, work on sleep. But you know, just in general, the three easiest things to do are just move a little bit, you know, stretch a little bit, kind of flex those abs, flex your glutes while driving, while sitting down. Right. Cool. Uh, let's talk about diet. Yeah. So I mean, as far as food goes. You know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, may or may not like things or whatever. But if we break it down, you know, you have protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Um, and the food industry, very early on, figured out that if they pair carbohydrates with fats and you add a little either salt and or some sugar in it, you have the same dopamine reaction as if you snorted a line of cocaine. Can you repeat that? Uh, just I want people to listen to that because yeah. you told me this a while back. So fat some sort of sugar, which is a carbohydrate, and usually there's a starch in it. Think McDonald's french fries, right? So fat, some sort of starch, sugar, salt. Those combined in your brain give you the same dopamine reaction, uh, the same hormone release that it would if you had some sort of cocaine. And what that is doing is basically literally addicting you to food. And this is what we're, and now, and then you, times, I don't know, when did they do that, in the 60s, right? right? So, you know, multiply that Six times, you know, 40 to 60 years or whenever it is before so many people caught on and everything is there. And I mean, the, the food that we're consuming is, unless you are going to look out for things, is so much less nutritious now than it was back then. And the reason for that is we find it cheaper, we find a way to process it, we find a way to make things faster, find a way to make things that are frozen and you know all down the lines. So the biggest thing that we can do is really focus on just a couple of things. And, you know, I'm big on small things that end up to big things. Right. So first of all would be, you know, how much are you how much how many times per day are you eating? You know, most people are gonna say one to three. Right. So I would try and have those people break those up a little bit and turn it into a three to five type of meals a day. So to start, just take what you're normally eating and break it up. From there, what you can do is you can start to eliminate some carbohydrates and focus on protein. So the easiest way to do that, eat all your protein first. Right. And then whatever else you have left, try and you know, limit, the, limit your carbohydrates to vegetables and fruits. From there, there's a whole myriad of things that you can do. But if you can, you know, if you can just get in some good fruits and vegetables and really focus on your protein content uh, and kind of start to break things up. And the reason to break things up is to uh, speed up your metabolism. So you want to kind of think of your, you know, metabolism, think of your body as like kind of a fireplace. You don't want to dump a big log on there because it actually lowers the fire down. Right. right? So right. It, you want to kind of throw some tinder in there, have these sparks and have, you know, this thing to kind of rev it up yep. and it's continually burning, burning, burning. And that's what you kind of want with your body. And the best way to do that is, again, protein, you know, some vegetables, carbohydrate, uh, some vegetables, healthy carbohydrates, um, fruits, whatever. Those things are, are going to be there. You know, if we can start to eliminate bread in general uh, and more specifically very processed white bread, um, you know, it's a... Uh, it's amazing how many people don't quite even think about all the bread that they eat, or they think that they need that bread. Right. Like, oh, I can't live without it. I'm like, well, you can. You can. You, there's, you know, we we did for approximately, I don't know, a couple million years. Right. right. Invented <laughs> no bread. Invented a bread. You know, as you know, it, 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 it is you know as old as Jesus, really. Right. Um, but it's one of those things where 
and you know until again kind of the middle of the 1900s it was actually good bread it was well done you know what i mean if you see homemade bread and kind of see all those cer the, those holes in the middle and everything along right. those lines that's actually good you want that that's actually a healthy bread and that's actually the the, the bacteria is broken down kind of all the gluten and everything else that has been in there and it's actually okay for you it's not that bad but you know when you get to enriched bleached all this other stuff right. it's really really you know they basically just bleach the flour make it as cheap as possible it's so they couldn't actually sell the bread when it started right because it had zero nutritional value so they actually had to enrich it with vitamins to, uh, to say to it's actually say it has some interesting content wow. to it. so um you know trying to eliminate some bread trying to eliminate some pasta trying to eliminate some rice and just you know just focus on that for now and then as you kind of go again there's so many different avenues to take but you know I'm a bigger fan of kind of um, what is now being called kind of somewhat of an elimination diet so it's basically saying hey all I want you to do is just eat protein because that's going to show you it's going to create a discipline good habits show you that you can survive on it and it's going to really accelerate the process so anybody that I work with the first week could try and say okay cool man here's what you're going to do yep. you're going to eliminate everything just protein and that's, that's all, all I want you to that's all I want you to eat I want you to prove to yourself that you can do it and then what's really great is to say just do it for seven days on the eighth day I'm gonna give you a cheat meal you can eat whatever you want so let's just talk for a second when you're yeah. talking about protein right you know like I I don't know how many million conversations you and I've had okay how much protein should I have how right. much this how much of that so let's talk about that on the sense of well let's start talk about what is a protein so protein is you know any sort of meat any sort of egg you know there are a lot of protein powders out there fish you know, these are the things that are the most protein dense. I always get the question like, well, peanut butter has protein. Well, peanut butter has protein, but it's not all protein. Right. What we're looking at is just like, if it died to get to your plate, go for it. Okay, so cheese wouldn't be? Cheese, cheese is gonna be more of a fat thing. Fat. Okay. And I mean, you know, there's always gonna be those the, those things that kind of ride the line, right? right? So I mean, in a you know an elimination or carnivore or, you know, keto t style of diet, you know, fats are okay. Right. But it's one of those things where, you know, if you let people off a little bit, they they're going to go far. all the way right. over here right. to where it goes from like, hey, you can have protein and fat, you know, oh, I'm a keto. And then, you know, like, oh, man, I had six keto pancakes this morning. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, just no, 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 not yet. You're not there yet right. to, to kind of experiment, you know, you know, and taking that and, you know, how much protein should you eat? Usually it's going to be a one gram of protein per pound of body weight. The more active you are, the more protein you should be taking in. Bodybuilders are going to be anywhere between two to two and a half times uh, their body weight in grams of protein. So if you're a 200 pound um, individual, you know your goal to start would be 200 grams of carbohydrates and give you a little bit of frame of reference. You, know, you mean protein? Yeah, yes, I'm Not sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. It's okay. Yes, yes. I know. Um, you know, a, a, a chicken breast the size of about your hand is going to be about 20 grams. Right. So you figure that you need 10 of those a day. Yeah, and, Just one, kind of, yeah, and one egg is about 6 grams of carbohydrate. So I was actually, protein. it's actually kind of funny. I was just watching um, Thor on his uh, um, YouTube page, and he was talking about how he eats 12 eggs. And I was like, yeah. wow, that you know, 12 times 6, you're talking about almost 75 80 grams right there. Yeah. That's a lot of protein. That, I mean, I don't. I don't even know if I. Not I can do 400 pound individual. Yeah, though. he's he's huge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do like four, and I'm like my max out. But I think it's a really good point that like, if you do eliminate everything, and I've been really pushing not eating carbs. Mm. You know, I'll have a little bit here. You know, the healthier carbs, um, because I've realized that like my body has a gastric bypass patient. And that's another thing people have to understand. Absolutely. You have to look at what works for you or what works for me or what works yeah. for Dustin. May not work for whoever else is watching this. And that's something you really have to understand. Yes. You really need to like, first, I think, what the best thing you made me do is go get your blood tests. Yes. See where your body, where your numbers are, and then continue it. I drop fast because of the gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about chicken, steaks, what kind of meat, like red meats or... You know what kind of meats are you any uh, yeah anything you know my wife's pregnant right now so she doesn't like a lot of thank you uh, so she's not a huge red meat fan at this point she's starting to kind of come back uh, but you know we eat a lot of steak a lot of bison um, you know a lot of chicken do pork uh, fairly often the kids love shrimp uh, one of my my one daughter is you know completely in love with salmon so I mean anything along those lines, you know, you're you're and non-fried, you know, trying to grill it or have it, you know, pan seared or something along those lines. Um, you know, there's there are again, we're we're, we're talking in generalities right. a lot just because 
you don't know who's going to kind of stumble upon this. But normally, unless you have some really, really medical stuff, you know, red meat kind of gets a bad rap in general. Right. You know, it, it's not the cholesterol in red meat that is giving people heart attacks or finding. It's the carbohydrates combined with, you know, some fat and, you know, sugar and salt. That's what's raising people's blood pressure, making their hearts hard to kind of, you know, get the blood where it needs to go. So because of that, red meat has kind of got... A, a bad really bad rap yeah. for it, yeah. and we're we're finding out that now that we're looking at all the literature and all the scientific stuff that was done back then, it was totally skewed. And there's literally the um, I think he was a health director or the director for one of the administrations was actually being paid by the sugar industry to villainize, you know, um, more of the the fat and more of the red meat and the cholesterol aspects of things and try and get people to go low fat, high carbs. So I think that was somewhere around the Reagan administration, okay. Okay, something along those lines. Uh, and you know, from that, we're still trying to recover from that. And I mean, if you look at the numbers of obesity and I mean, everything else that goes on, you know, that's the one of the biggest epidemics, you know, <coughs> during the pandemic. There's a huge ep epidemic and you know, we're finding out that you're incredibly unhealthy. And when you're incredibly unhealthy, things like a COVID, things like a flu, things like a pneumonia, you, they might I mean, take you out. Right. So, I mean, it's not, you know, these things are really, really affecting you. So, you know, any protein that you can kind of get, and this go, you know, it can be very, very easy. I mean, if you're a driver and you drive past an in and out or a McDonald's or a Wendy's or a something, probably more times than you even know, and they are starting to have, you know, options where you're like bunless or, you right. know, low carb or whatever it ends up being, you know, I mean, it's just about making better decisions, you know, like if you walk into a Subway, which is better than a McDonald's, right. and instead of getting the sandwich, you get the salad, right. you know, now you've made two better decisions, and hopefully those better decisions build on each other, become habits, and kind of keep rolling on down the line. Yeah, I think it's really important to think about that, especially for our drivers that, yeah. you know, they're on the road, I think meal prepping is important. I mean, I know it's hard for a lot of people. I'm not a cook. Right. So I do the basics. Like I'll do, you know, like every day I've now brought, I make a salad at home with cold cuts and I put a little bit of dressing, a vinaigrette kind of style dressing. Yeah. And that's my lunch. And I eat that. I basically split it into two meals. You know, I have my breakfast either depending eggs or protein shake, depending on how I'm feeling. And then dinner, I kind of focus really on my protein. Uh, maybe a little carbs to kind of just as a treat for myself. Right. But I think it's really important that meal prepping is something you think about. You don't need a lot of right. time. I think one of the things that you led me into was Stan Efferding's vertical diet. Yes. And I think that's something maybe you could talk about if you don't mind. Sure. So Stan Efferding is a uh, world record holding power lifter, but he's also a pro bodybuilder. And he's probably one of the smartest people that I know. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very fortunate to have him kind of in my corner. And, you know, um, one of the people that I refer a lot of people out to, I referred Hathor to him. And, yeah. you know, Can you tell everybody who Hathor is? Hathor is the mountain from Game of Thrones. Um, and he also a world's strongest man two times. Um, won Beast. Arnold. Yeah, he's a six foot nine, 440 pound shredded guy. He's just a, an impressive uh, species of human, I guess. I don't even know if you call but he, he <laughs> just <laughs> broke a record. Yeah, he just broke the uh, all-time uh, deadlift record. He deadlifted 501 kilos, which is 1,100, and four or five pounds, something along those lines. Four and a half times my body weight. Reason. It, it's incredibly ridiculous. strong. And he, <laughs> the worst part of what, about it is it was it looked fairly it, easy. It was crazy because somebody called me and was like, did you see it? I'm like, yeah. And he was like, did you see the bar bend? I'm like, that's what happens when you put 1,100 pound bar on a me on metal. Yeah, like, that's just nothing. That bar was like almost a perfect U. Yeah, and he and he smiled. Yeah, the whole time. Yeah, there was one point I saw that he looked like he was a little struggling. I don't know if it was struggle more than like, oh shit, this is heavy. Yeah, and then it was like straight up, and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I just witnessed this. Yeah, and th I mean, and you obviously know him very well, and you guys do communicate a lot. But let's go back to the vertical diet. Sure. Side. So a vertical diet is just again. Uh, it's more than anything, again, just trying to eliminate uh, bad carbohydrates. It's going to focus on just meat, vegetables, and pretty much white rice. And, um, you know, adding in, you know, carrots and orange juice and stuff along those lines as we get further into things. But it's just basically opposed to, like, so if we look at things like your protein, carbohydrates, fats are your macros, but he's also looking at your micronutrients. So he, you know, really encourages a lot of nutrient dense foods like carrots, spinach, bell peppers, 
And what he's trying to do is make sure that those micronutrients are in your body because your body is just a giant chemical reaction. Okay. And it needs, not only does it need water to make all these things go, right. uh, but it also needs a lot of micronutrients and um, you know, things like iodine um, that are you know, in salt that you know you you need a lot of in order to have your pituitary kick out all of the hormones that you need to kind of go and in, in very much in particular you know your thyroid which a lot of people may be struggling with a slower high, uh, slower thyroid a lot of times when you kind of bump up their salt you know people end up losing five to ten pounds immediately right. by doing exactly what the FDA has told you not to do by adding salt to things right. So a lot of things like that that are, you know, again, misnomers and, and, and focusing on that. But, you know, again, what I really, really enjoy about Stan is he really breaks things down to be as simple as possible. Yes. And it's, it's you know, he kind of created this whole monster mash thing, which is basically like, it's spinach, ground beef, and rice. That's it. That's pretty much it. And you put it in the microwave and it, I was... It tastes great. It, 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 listen, I there's been some foods that I've ordered, you know, through Freshly and all these companies mm -hmm. and they've been good. But this, I threw in the microwave and ate it, and I was just like, and I was full. Right. Like, I was a full, like, not heavy feeling full. And I think that's a lot of people still are learning, and I still, too, because, I mean, coming from being 400 pounds to this, I still have the battle of when am I full, actually full. Right. Not mentally. When's my body telling me I'm done compared to my mind saying, oh, I'm still hungry. Right. So finding that happy place, and I think the meals from the vertical diet, Stan definitely did this, and you turned me on to it, was... They're almost like perfectly fit for anybody. Yeah. And it's just, uh, and I don't want to keep talking about diets because I think a lot of people, you know, oh, I can't diet. I don't have time to do this. So the reason I brought up the vertical diet is because you could order the food. It could be delivered to your house. It could yeah. deliver anywhere. Yeah. Um, and we're actually looking at trying to find a way to make it more accessible for the executive side of our clients. So uh, down the road, we'll talk about that more. And maybe hopefully one day we get Stan here yeah. and he'll be able to be willing to talk oh, to us. Oh, for sure. Um, but, but I think in general what we need to think about is it's like, you know, meal prep can be a lot easier than you think. Correct. So I mean you can order something like from, you know, vertical meals and have those frozen things that, you know, every every gas station in the world and if you're a driver you gotta go get gas, they have a microwave and they're happy to let you use that. Yep. You know, you can have those things packed and prepared. And you know, if you throw a bunch of meat on a grill and you throw it in a Tupperware, that's it. Get a rice cooker, you got your rice. Right. Chop up some vegetables. If you go to the right, um, if you go to Whole Foods or whatever, that's already chopped for you. You know, these are all things that you know, kind of hacks that can make things so much for easier. Sure. I think so many people see this giant mountain, you know, and you know, it doesn't need to be a white tablecloth. And, you know, right. very elegantly prepared <laughs> food. Right. It's just like. Just make sure it's done enough to where you don't get stuff with all poisoning. <laughs> we don't want that problem. some vegetables in there. Call it a day. And call it a day. And, you know, try and, you know, make them again kind of a little bit smaller, eat throughout the day. Right. Drink a ton of water, and you're good. That's the other thing we should probably talk about. Is water, just, water, water. water is extremely important, but more important than that is, like, you know, try and lay off as many soft drinks as you can. Coke Zero doesn't count. You know, Pepsi Zero, right, yeah, whatever the hell doesn't feed. count. You know, the more you can kind of get rid of those, the better off you'll end up being. Um, <clears throat> for so many other reasons, and I'll only tell one story about that, but it's, it's high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup in your body, the way that things kind of happen is your liver has um, glucose and it kind of kicks it out into the bloodstream and your muscles end up using it and then it, you know once it's used you either produce more or you get it from your food right. and you kind of go from there. Right. High fructose corn syrup and then usually when it's you know expelled it goes back to the liver and then it gets kind of kicked back out again and you know does all this stuff, right? right. So what's interesting about a high fructose corn syrup is, is when you do ingest it, it goes to fill up your liver, kicks out to the muscles, comes back to the liver, and if the liver is full, usually you would kick it out, and you know, you know it's, it's waste. Right. But with high fructose corn syrup, it goes in storage, which is fat. Oh, which is adipose right. tissue, okay? okay? So I mean, and to give you a big frame of reference, you know, your body is gonna only be able to store and use about 20 to 30 grams of, of sugar at a time. Okay. A 12 ounce soda has about 90? So the rest of it and turns into fat, basically. Turns into fat. And how many people do you know who drink one a day? <laughs> right? How many people do you know drink Roger, five? How many, how many do you drink a day? Come you, on, just say. No comment. Two, five. five. So, I mean, there's five, right? So that's 450 grams of carbohydrates. Right. And you're going to be able to approximately use about 40 of them a day. The others go to storage. Right. Now, Coke Zero is going to usually have, you know, zero carbohydrates, zero sugar, but it's fake sugar. But what they don't tell you is it has an insulin spike and your body kind of reacts the same. Right. So if you have any other leftover carbohydrates, that's where it, it kind of goes. Right. And, you know, these are chemicals that I know you can't pronounce. Um, 
those are not those are not really great to have in your body. If you can't say them, don't put them in your body. It's more than like two syllables. You You're done. It's terrible. Yeah. Go go freak yourself out. Turn it around and look at it. It's just like oh my god. I can't even smell. Um, yeah. So I mean, really limiting your you know what you're kind of consuming. I'm never gonna take away coffee from people because I drink almost oh. as more coffee as anybody else. Yes. So do your coffee, but try and stick to water with everything else. Yeah. So I agree. I'll get off my soapbox from there. Uh, no, I, I think it's really good information because I think a lot of people, you know, like I'm, I love Diet Coke. It's yeah. like one of, but I try to limit myself to one a day, if that even. Yeah. I've been drinking a lot more iced tea just because I, I have to say that the Diet Coke doesn't have a lot of caffeine. It helps me kind of get through the day sure. without, and I'm not a big coffee person. So iced tea has to, it tends to help me. So that's, um, but what I want, I want to bring this back to kind of our industry. Um, everybody knows um, one of my employees, Dustin Baker. Uh, he's been in this business for, fuck, I don't even know how many, how long he's been around. Um, but um, when Dustin, I'm going to tell the story because uh, he, he probably will kill me. But he doesn't <laughs> even know I'm talking about him. But I guess that's what happens when you work for me. Yeah. Right. I could say what I want to say. Um, so Dustin came to me, I, I want to say it's been about two and a half years. And I remember we were sitting on these couches. And uh, he was kind of in a position where he was uh, he was no longer working somewhere. And he was looking for a job, and I said to him, "I'll hire you because I like." There's a, you, obviously you know Dustin really yeah. well. His personality is contagious. Yes. Um, and he sat here and we talked, and I said, "The only way that I'm going to hire you, um, after me telling him my story, obviously, being sure. him, is that I want you to concentrate on your weight." Uh, not because I want you to look a certain way, I want you to feel a certain way so that you can last with me for the next 20 years in this company. Right. Initially, he looked at me, like, not sure that, like, why did somebody just say this to me? But then he took a second and he was like, I'm game. And he's uh, been pretty religious at the gym. I mean, there's been hiccups here and there, but nothing too serious. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Dustin. I mean, Dustin is, obviously, everybody knows, on the heavier side. Uh, pretty active. Mm -hmm. I mean, he can move around. Yeah. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you, somebody that big can't do things well. I brought him to the gym. I introduced you to him about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, probably a little more than a little a year. bit more. Yeah, probably a little, a little year and a half ago. And, you know, I don't know weight wise how much he's lost. He's lost a lot. Yeah. And you can see it in his face. And, um, but he came in and you kind of took control. And I said, I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> I'll take care of the expenses, <clears throat> but I want you to train him. So, you know, with somebody like Dustin, who has no who's kind of in this different you know what did you do that, that convinced him to keep coming back like yeah that's kind of the secret in the sauce is you know if you could it's very hard to get people into the gym right and then it's even harder to keep them coming back and going from there so again kind of the small small little things and small little goals you know Dustin kind of understood that he was in a place where he had a really nice opportunity to you know uh, improve his career uh, but also improve himself as a human being and, you know, his body and, and kind of really make some nice steps and move forward because, I mean, he's really, he's actually pretty young. Um, and he was at a position where he was finally given the, ch the chance to do something about, you know, uh, his body and what was going on. So, you know, we, we went over some, some blood tests and we started talking about things and all I wanted him to do to start was just get to the gym, come in, hang out, dude loves to talk, if I could convince Everybody him, knows if that. I could do him to convince a little bit of something while we were chatting, right. <clears throat> we're better off for it. <clears throat> um, COVID. And COVID, uh, and from from there, I started having him do a food log, and then we would kind of talk about you know what you're eating, why you're eating it, yep. when you're eating it. And he was honest. He was very honest. In the beginning, which, you know, you really, you know, most people are not, 100%. and um, you know, really credit to him for taking it on, and you know. Uh, Hopefully, I mean, you know, from, you know, chatting with you and, you know, kind of being in the environment that we've created, it, you know, we don't care. Yeah, we're not no, a judge, no judgment, you know, no judgment or as little judgment as possible. Right. And if it is, it's, it's you know, joking. very jokingly. Um, so he was able to really kind of just lay it all out there and kind of make some stuff known. And it made my job a lot easier because I was like, okay, cool. Hey, let's just turn this dial here, 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 and let's try and do some of this stuff. You know, there are some, you know, there are some non-starters, you know, like I got to have my sushi and I got to have this. And I'm like, okay, cool. We can play with that as long as you give me this. It's like, okay, all right, fine. There's always going to be a bargaining process, no matter what you do, whether it's business, whether it's dealing with people eating, Give working out, etc. So you kind of got to find that sweet spot and you got to find out what people are unwilling to give up and, you know, what people are willing to play with and, you know, give you. Um, 
and, you know, uh, getting him in there. And, you know, once he started to kind of move around and he was able to move a little bit of weight, you know, I actually had to end up kind of holding him back a little bit. I'm like, hey, we're not focused on how much you can lift here. Right. We're just working on trying to get you, you know, kind of bulletproof you so you're not going to end up with any sort of injuries or something along those lines and really help kind of improve your health markers. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, we go along and go along and he has some... Um, some blood tests and some uh, some doctor's appointments and stuff that were, you know, kind of put on the calendar and you know try and really direct himself to. And you know, to his credit, you know, he he worked really really hard and he did a good job of you know kind of changing his lifestyle yeah. and you know kind of worked on making a lot more meals at home and kind of cutting out some of the soda and doing some of the other stuff that you know he had. And he started to feel a lot better. He started yeah. to look a lot better moving a lot better, all of a sudden his endurance, his endurance goes way up, you know, his feet stop hurting, you know, he's, he's literally starting to feel better. And something else I wanted to talk to you about, and the reason why I like to do an elimination and then a, a cheat meal, is I want people to understand how terrible their body feels oftentimes when they go Cheat. back and they do what they were doing before. And I was like, look, this is, the good, this is the good gas that you get, and that's the gas that you buy on the corner that is full of dirt and right. just a bunch of shit. And that's dollars. what you're trying to put in your car and try and move, right. opposed to this premium, beautiful gasoline that really helps you kind of go. It's a really interesting learning process because people are like, oh my God, I can't wait for my cheat meal. I'm like, yep, I can't wait either. And they're sick and they're, they feel awful and they, you know, they Come shit the themselves yeah. or they're constipated for a day and a half. And they're like, what the hell happened? I'm like, well, you, I mean, you just ate trash, dude. Right. You ate out of a dumpster. What do you expect? Right. And then you're like, oh, I don't want to feel like that. It's like, look, your, your your body is an amazing adaptative machine. It'll figure out how to deal with and how to move forward with whatever you give it. I mean, was Rasputin, you know, made himself uh, immune to arsenic. Right. Because he took a little bit each day and just increased it. Right. So because he was scared people were going to poison him. Right. So your body can handle a whole lot of stuff. Right. But if you want it to move properly, if you want to think well, you want to do your stuff, you gotta focus on the stuff, that, the, the fuel that it wants that's actually good for you. What it needs. So, uh, you know, and that's kind of what Dustin started to feel. And he yeah. started like, man, you know, the more I eat better, the better I feel. And then obviously what happens when you went back into um, the doctor, you know, blood levels, uh, or, you know, his, his blood markers, blood pressure, heart rate, you know, everything, you know, especially for a, a guy his size is amazing. You know, yeah. I mean, the doctor was, almost freaked out yeah he was shocked i he remember was very the, shocked the call yeah and uh it was a really really proud moment for 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 dustin and you know very you know i was you know really really proud to have been along uh along for the ride with with dustin as well it, you know there's a lot of stuff that he did so well and so right and he, you know and hopefully that that feeling was rewarding and you know it it made him a little bit more motivated wanted to do more and, you know kind of kept going and that's the whole you know, it, that's the whole thing. It's like if you can do a little bit of stuff and then you really kind of pay attention to how you're feeling, you know, it, it's just going to keep rolling and rolling and rolling. If you keep feeding into that good, then it's just going to keep going opposed to kind of keep reverting back and forth. So, yeah, I think, you know, I remember when he we went to the Las Vegas show, not this year, but the year before. Actually, so he's been around you for almost, almost two, two years. years yes. Yeah. This would be two years. Shutdown has been really Re blurred everybody. everything's yeah. time. <laughs> but I remember he was uh, um, kind of at that place where he wasn't sure how Vegas was. We got him a new suit. Do you remember he got that yep. three-piece suit? Yeah. And he walked around, and I remember people coming up to me like, oh, my God. Like, he's walking better. He's not breathing as hard. And he even said it to me. And so I was super proud of him yeah. for being able to do it. So. Big ups to you, Dustin. I know you're going to watch this and you're going to be like, I can't believe we're talking about it. <laughs> um, but we're coming on the 50-minute mark, um, so we're a little bit more than we wanted to, but there's a couple more things I wanted to just touch. First, um, congratulations on being a father again. Thank you very much. Um, if people don't know, Jesse Burdick is married to Katie Hogan, uh, who is uh, a pretty well-known CrossFit athlete. Uh, she's been to the games a couple times. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know number-wise. I mean, you probably know how many times. I think she's been there two or three times. I don't cool. Know uh, she's also um, a trainer for a lot of the cr high level CrossFit athletes. Um, I know she's really close with Becca and uh, all these other people that uh, we love to watch at the CrossFit Games. Um, we don't know when that's going to happen or if that's going to happen again. But that's I think they're doing a small thing. It's they? individual only and it's going to be at the ranch. Oh, is it? Down here. Oh, cool. Yeah. So the ranch is in Santa Cruz for anybody who wants to know. Yeah. Um, so congratulations on the 
Thank you. You are going to be conquered by women. Yes. So you have, a girl have another coming. girl, you know, to add add a third to uh, third one to the mix. Yeah, because you have twins. I do. Um, names? Uh, Casey and Sophia, and they'll be um, thirteen. And they are in badass uh, athletes. athletes. Yeah, they're they're doing good. It's, they're, it's been a, you know, I mean, the the shutdown has been really weird and frustrating and stressful. But I mean, just to get to take that time that I probably wouldn't have been able to have. Right. Um, if, in any other circumstance and kind of get to hang out with them a lot more and spend some more time with them it's been really really awesome That's you know awesome. it's uh you know i'm really proud of who they are and kind of the people that they are they're you know these really weird kids and it's fantastic and it's the coolest yeah i mean there's a we can talk about their yeah i can talk I, about wait, my kids all day yeah i mean they're beautiful girls they're Thank super you. smart and um it's great to watch your guys social media because i follow you guys obviously Thank you. um so congratulations on that Thanks. um you know, I wanted to, the last kind of thing I want to talk about is um, I thought you know a bunch of us who are members of Powerwad who are your our coach, and we all have this kind of same thing that you set a tone and environment at the gym that's welcoming to everybody. You make us all feel um, a part of something. Yeah. And I, I my dad when I took over the company, my dad said to me, make your employees feel like they're part of the company. Not that they work for the company. Sure. And I think that's where like you and I really get the, and I got so much from you on that. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I think a lot of people want to talk about how do you get your drivers, especially at now, you got drivers that are making way more now than they were making because, <laughs> of, because of the stimulus package. Sure. And, and hey man, I, I'm all for it. But eventually that's going to come to an end. Right. And we've got to, you know, how do you keep everybody? Like, I mean, there's rifts in our in our sure. team. We know that. Sure. But for the most part, 99% everybody likes each other. Yeah. And they get along. So how do you how do you do as the the owner, the coach, or whatever you want to classify yourself? Yeah, I, I think you have to you know you have to start to separate some stuff and have faith in going into your business uh, and make it a place that you personally would want to work at or work out at or you know be a part of the whole situation. And um, obviously there's going to be some things that you have to do as an owner that, you know, you may not necessarily always like. But, um, you know, just it, it should be fun, you know. I mean, there's so many other things that stress people out every day, whether it's family, whether it's work, whatever. You know, my, my whole goal was to, to be able to have people separate all that stuff, walk through the gym doors, and be a completely different person. And, you know, they're going to be with me for, you know, uh, to start probably about you know 45 minutes to an hour right. and then once they really kind of get into it they're here for two, two three, three four hours yeah. and some of them never leave which I really like you know that means it's kind of become home Tiny the, tip yes, for me. yeah so the, the gym for me you know I've had some tough times in my life and it literally saved my life it was the place it was a refuge where I could go and I could forget about everything else and I could just focus on improving myself for however long I was there and if I didn't have that, I don't know where I would necessarily be. So my whole goal was to create a spot where anyone can come and just get the most out of, you know, I will help them get the most out of their body and the most out of their head, and then I can push them out the door better than they came in. Right. And that's always been the goal of anyone that I have coming in. <clears throat> Some people will fight me and, you know, eventually they'll secede to it and then they'll really start to kind of move on with things. But for the most part, you know, people are always, people want to be welcome. People want to be a part of a team. Great. People want to have fun. People want to relax and hang out and shit talk and, you know, be a part of something. Right. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a hard line, you know, hard ass about it. You know, it, it, it's a welcoming thing. And it's more of a very Socratic method where, you know, I kind of put it there and be like, it's there whenever you're ready for it. Right. And there's more closer you end up getting right and there's some people who come in with very standoffish very kind of hard and then eventually you kind of see that it crack and it softens and these people you know become friends with some other people that I never would have thought they were friends with and now they're you know you're going out to dinner and doing all this other stuff and you know there's relationships that kind of build from that and it all becomes a really really cool thing but for me it's always you know the the gym for me in my head was a place where I could get away be who I wanted to be, know that it was going to get me better and I could leave and, and, and be a better person when I need to be a dad or, you know, need to deal with more of the business side of things or whatever I ended up needing to be. And let's just say human being. Right. Um, <clears throat> and to, to create that was just 
being understanding of and empathetic to everybody else's situation where right not everyone is necess not no one's who I am right? right right everyone's coming in with different baggage and you know everyone has different goals and everyone has different abilities but that doesn't mean that they can't be a part of a team and it doesn't mean that they can't work really hard and create something accomplish something or whatever just like allowing people the ability the place to express themselves to to do this thing and whatever their goals are but just kind of be a part of it and kind of go yep. and you know that's you know I've been very very lucky because you know I really do believe that like attracts like and you know I've got a lot of people in and you know I don't I've never advertised anything and everything's by word of mouth and you know you know I started with you know just just with the baseball kids that I started, I started with three and I ended up with 45 within a year and a half it's crazy and it's just because people start talking about it it's yep. a place people want to go right and you know that's the uh, the the Starbucks guy always talks about that third place right you know what I mean yeah uh, and and that's what I think the gym can be for people and for for the people who understand it it is and uh, that's kind of what I wanted to create and I've been very lucky that <clears throat> people have been uh, have allowed me to bring them in and allow them to just be who they are yep. and you know uh, be weird and be <laughs> and be awkward yep. and be just who they are and just love them for it right. because a lot of times they're you know there's very few places that they can get that sometimes yep. so um, you know just it, it's a place that I would be very proud to be a member of yep. and be a part of right and you know that's hopefully that's the the, the community and the the place that I create for people and you know it's 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 not that hard. It's not about the amenities that you have. It's not about you know the all the flashy shit. It's just showing that you care, yeah. that you give a, a shit about people, and that you want them to do better and you want them to be better. And that that that's really not that much to ask. And I I think uh, to wrap that up, I think that everything you just said is what we as owners can do for our employees. I think so, 100%. Because if you bring in a, have an environment, I think our culture here is we're all friends. Yeah. Uh, everybody could, you know, access me anytime. You know, I try to make it a family environment. Everybody's welcome. It, you know, we don't have all the amenities and all that stuff that we pass out to like other companies. But I think if you ask any of the drivers, it's the culture that we've just built here. Yeah. They know that they're a part of this brand. Yeah. You know, Urban BCN is a brand. It's not me. It's not my brother or sister who's involved or my, even my dad, it's a brand, and they love and care for it, wearing the hats or the sweaters we buy them. I mean, that's big for them, and so I think everything you said is how most owners should listen, and I think it's really important that they listen to what you just said, because making people feel like they can come here and wanna be here is all you need. Yeah. Because then is. they're gonna spend more and more time, because I remember when I first started, I was like 45 minutes, and there are times I'm there two and a half hours and I don't even realize. <laughs> so, you know, we're gonna wrap this up, Jesse. You know, I love you like a brother. You've been yeah, amazing like uh, for me, mentally, physically, everything on my whole life. You know, I, I seriously think that where I am today is people like you who helped me. No, um, I'm so happy to be here and honored to get to get to be called coach by you. Yeah, you're definitely my coach, my mentor, my big brother. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at powerwod.com, powerwod.com, or Jesse Burdick, J E S S E B U R D I C K, at gmail.com, no matter what. Yeah, so we'll put a link at the bottom of this YouTube video um, for you guys to connect with him. Uh, I'll tell you um, whether you could come to Pleasanton to him coach you or do it you know, online, I promise you, you're going to get the results you want by, if you just listen to him. <laughs> and it's a secret that he doesn't want anybody to know. Yeah, yeah. We're not allowed to tell people he knows what he's doing. So again, Jess, love you. My man, Thank love you very you much. Thank you. Thanks for watching, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, follow us on all the Instagrams and all that other stuff, and I'll put it on uh, the page at the end. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.